to you and, th and just get used to the motion of the mass, I call it. But um, We've been talking, the past three weeks we've been talking about anger. We've been talking about how to make our home sweet again. Put the sweet back in home sweet home. We've been talking about that. How to put the sweet back in home sweet home and to get rid of anger, which St. Francis de Sales says you can do, you know, especially if you work at it. I mean, not overnight, maybe, unless you get a special grace for that, but uh, over time, you could do that. And I thought about saying more about anger, <laughs> but I just decided, I wasn't even sure I was gonna preach today, actually, this is kind of a last minute thing. And, and the more I thought about this reading, I was really taken by the image of the water swamping the boat in the gospel story today, in the gospel account. Uh, how in one translation it says, the water covered the boat. And in another translation, the water swamped the boat. And so I thought, I was just fascinated with that. And, um, and I just, I think it's, it's good to talk about the resurrection, which I think this story is really all about. Uh, we have other times to talk about the resurrection. It's such an important thing to think about the resurrection. So I thought we would do that. We would just kind of go through this story in Matthew, take a little bit of a breather, really just look at this event that happened in Christ's life. It's in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, and it's only four verses, four little verses. And the first verse uh, is very simple. It's that uh, Jesus gets into the boat, and the disciples followed him into the boat. But already there, I think, what you have, if you really think about it, is a kind of procession. You know, Jesus is leading, the disciples are following, and they follow his presence into this um, vessel, this conveyance, which will be set in motion to take them where they want to go. And so, in this boat, as the disciples enter, Christ is already in the boat. He's already present there. He has led his disciples into the boat. So his presence is the matrix for the, the disciples being wherever they are and going wherever they go. The word matrix, by the way, comes from the word mater, mother. So Christ's presence is like the nurturing presence and the, um, uh, yeah, I'll just say nurturing presence uh, that the disciples are drawn to and want to follow. And he is their reason for being wherever they go, wherever they are and going wherever they go. So they set off on the, on the sea, so-called, and in verse 24, this is just the next verse, the next sentence really, a storm comes up on the sea. Now, th what this means is death. I mean, this is instant death. Because in the scriptures, I mean, water is a sign of grace on the one hand, and that's a whole other thing. In the Gospel of John, chapter 4, with the Samaritan woman, water is a symbol of grace. But water is also in, used in, as a symbol of death in the scriptures. We see that as the, um, as the Israelite people pass through the Red Sea. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But water is a sign of death. And here, especially, because we're talking about these men being on the sea, being on the sea, there, there is no stability. You get no leverage if you're on the sea. You know, if you're in a little boat like these men were, you know, it, it's bobbing around. It's especially if there's a storm, if the sea is violent, you're being kind of tossed around. You got no stability, you got no leverage. So um, there is no, no ability in a sense to really put up a fight against whatever you're fighting. You feel helpless. For, secondly, uh, there's stuff under the sea, there are things that are alive and that are hungry. Not necessarily on the sea that they're on, 
but still, symbolically, on the sea, there are things that you cannot see. You, you have no way to know from which direction they are coming and what their posture is, and they're hungry. And so um, the, the threat of the sea is also a no. What is going on under this tumultuous surface is something you cannot know. In the hidden depths, and the, and the depths themselves, just the fact that you are in the depths themselves, that you are exposed to these depths with current that can take you into themselves as being deep, that itself is a threat. The depth of the abyss, which would be capable of swallowing them whole. And that was, the, that, the Sea of Galilee is capable of that. So, uh, that is why the Fathers of the Church, uh, the Catechism in paragraph 1221, and even the scriptures themselves in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, at the very first few verses of that chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, tells us that the Red Sea uh, was a kind of a baptism for the, it, it prefigured baptism, the Red Sea prefigured baptism for us Christians because when the Israelites marched through the Red Sea, they escaped death through water. Anyway, so the darkness of the storm, the darkness of the storm, the violence of the storm, and the violent sea, all of that. And what happens? <laughs> Jesus is asleep? Come on. Come on. How could Jesus be asleep? I mean, really, in the storm like that, what kind of sleep is that? Jesus is asleep. Well, obviously, this is a sleep like death, right? And death is a kind of sleep. We refer to death that way. Both of my parents have gone to sleep uh, in that way. We, we refer to death as a kind of sleep where sur we surrender. That's, that's why your kids, by the way, put up such a big fuss when it's time to go to sleep. They, they instinctively know they don't want to sleep because they know to, that to render themselves uh, to this unconscious state is to make themselves vulnerable. And, and also, in addition to that, also to stop living, you know, in a way. They're going to be surrendering the joy and the wonder of life by going to sleep. They don't want to do that. Nobody wants to do that. How would you sleep on a violent sea in a bobbing boat with 12 other frightened men. How well would you sleep in those circumstances? No, this is, this is a symbol of uh, Christ's death. They're, 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 on this, they're on this journey together uh, in this unknown and threatening place. And uh, this is a sign of the death of Christ. And the disciples, are afraid, just as they were afraid when Jesus was arrested and tortured and killed. In the same way, the disciples are filled with fear. One layer of truth, one dimension of meaning that we take from this historical account in the life of Jesus and his disciples is that God is consistently always preparing his people to receive the grace of the resurrection. That is what's happening here in this story. The grace of Christ's resurrection is whispered all throughout the Old Testament. It's whispered loudly all throughout the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 6, in Isaiah chapter 38, verse 16, in Hosea chapter 6, verse 2, in Jonah chapter 2, verse 6, and in other places in the Old Testament, Christ's resurrection is prophecy. Prophecy? Prophesied. Anybody? For example, 
in, even in the story of Job, uh, which is famous, a famous story even among non-believers, this is also, the story of Job is also the story of Jesus. Because Job is a blameless man who suffers the loss of his loved ones because of Satan. But then, after suffering and, and being rejected by all of his loved ones, he gets a new life from God. That Jesus, uh, that Jesus would triumph over death is also prefigured in Jesus' own life when he raises people from the dead, like the boy who died, uh, the son of the widow of Nain, and, uh, Nain and, um, and, and Jairus' daughter, and Lazarus. So, uh, this, this is the work of God, to always be preparing us for the graces of the resurrection. St. Paul himself, who is quite obviously a verifiable historical figure, inarguably historical figure, uh, and who sacrificed his life, sacrificed his life for years in the service of the proclamation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, breaks down the authoritative witness of the risen Lord to the Corinthians uh, in chapter 15 of his first letter. He says, in, that, in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, he says, first, St. Paul, or Cephas, saw the Lord in Luke 24. Then, uh, more, then the Twelve saw the Lord. And then more than 500 men and women, most of whom were still living at the time when St. Paul wrote this letter to them. Think about that in terms of the truth value of the resurrection of Christ. Then. Jesus appeared also individually to James, the Bishop of Jerusalem, because he was the Bishop of Jerusalem. That's a significant thing. And then all the other disciples of the Lord who continued Christ's mission of preaching. Jesus appeared to these people. And then finally, Paul himself. No mention of Christ's appearance to the women is made, even though it is reported to us in the Gospel of John chapter 20 and in Luke chapter 24, probably because the testimony of women had no legal bearing among the ancient Hebrews. So what we find when it comes to the resurrection is that the apostles were not expecting Jesus to rise from the dead. This is something the apostles were not expecting. Uh, even though even though Jesus told them that that's exactly what he was going to do, they were still not expecting it. And even though Jesus raised people from the dead, the death of Jesus on the cross actually crushed the hope of his followers. The death of Jesus on the cross just devastated the disciples of Jesus. And that was one of the reasons why, once he did rise from the dead, Jesus undertakes a prolonged catechesis. He undertakes a prolonged series of brief appearances to his disciples, during which time he offers them gentle exhortations to peace and to faith. And he instructs his, his followers on the prophetic dimensions of the sacred scriptures uh, that point to his triumph over death. And he also, by the way, sometimes he actually does scold them. For example, in Luke chapter 24, Jesus does say, O foolish man, to, he says this is to his disciples, O foolish man and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? That's Luke 24, 25 and 26. The resurrection is the foundational truth of the mystery of Jesus Christ. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, in paragraph 638, it says, the resurrection of Jesus is the crowning truth of our faith, a faith that is believed and lived as the central truth by the first Christian community and handed on as fundamental by tradition, established by the documents of the New Testament, and preached as an essential part 
of the Paschal Mystery along with the cross. The resurrection is not reincarnation, it is not reanimation, and it is not simply uh, the, the evocation of the immortality of the soul, for example, by, like the Gnostics claim. It is, in fact, the body of Jesus Christ, fully transfigured into a spiritual reality. St. Paul uses the word pneumatic. It is the new life of a human body, Jesus' body, entirely pervaded by the breath of God's creator spirit. That's what the resurrection is. It's a divine transcendence of the human body and its victory over sin and also over death. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The resurrected body of Christ is the body on which we will now feast, brothers and sisters. We will feast on the resurrection. We will eat and drink the very substance of him who said, I am the resurrection and the life.